Last week we ended with God calling all people to faith in his promises. We said that this is the needed human response by all people, chapter 9, verses 30 to 33. If you didn't watch our lesson last week, hopefully by this time next week you'll have done so. Each of our previous 10 classes are all on our YouTube playlist of Romans. Remember, Paul is dealing with the issue of the confidence he's hoping to engender in the believers who are reading his letter. He assured them in chapter 8 that nothing could separate them from God's love. Here in chapter 10, he'll deal with Israel's failure to respond to God's righteousness, ending with the announcement in verse 21 that they're a disobedient and obstinate people. <laughs> Ouch. So the question today is, on what basis does the apostle say that Israel has failed in finding right standing with God? And if that is true, then a follow-up question may be, do the Jewish people have any hope at all? This chapter continues the study on the Jewish people and the theme of our book, Getting Right with God. Welcome to those of you who are new to our class in this, the 11th lesson, as we take up Paul's comments recorded in chapter 10 of the book of Romans. If you are watching this video after our class has ended today, then please pause the recording and read chapter 10. It'll only take three or four minutes, and uh, then push play again and come back as we'll try to bring meaning to it all. Okay, welcome back. For those of you on the Zoom call just now, have your Bible open, will you? And next week, make sure you read the chapter, which will be chapter 11, before you come to class. Today's outline, it's as follows, just three parts. A, Israel's failure and Paul's prayer, verses 1 to 5. B, Moses and Joel testify of faith as the answer, verses 6 to 13. And C, faith speaks, and so do Isaiah, and so should you, 14 to 21. All right. Israel's failure and Paul's answer and, and Paul's prayer. First, let me recognize one of Paul's favorite words. Paul loved the word brethren. He used the term 13 times in this letter alone and dozens more times throughout the rest of his letters. He used the word to describe his relationship with the former slave Onesimus and once Philemon, the slave owner, to treat him Quote, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? Philemon 16. Paul saw the newly born again former slave who ran away as a brother, both to Philemon and to himself. What a word of endearment. Hardly one which we may say characterized the hostility or caste system measure we see later in history. Do you remember the first word that Rabbi Saul actually heard from anyone after the episode on the road to Damascus? He had been struck by God with blindness and was led to a house in town where he sat for days, three days in fact, without food, water, or the ability to see. And he was praying. Just then, God spoke to a believer named Ananias to go to the house of Judas, who lived on Straight Street. After a bit of negotiations, Ananias went to the house, walked in, laid his hands on Paul, on Saul at the time, and said, Brother Saul, and prophesied what God wanted for the future apostle. In one moment, all the pent-up emotions of hatred and threats were dispelled, and Saul was born again. The first word he heard in his blindness from someone who knew the dangers of this, the dangers of this welcome, the first word Saul heard was brother. So Paul's use of the term here in the plural to the Romans, brethren, is a similar endearing word. He already introduced this section in chapter 9 with the plaintive cry, similar to Moses, aching for the Jewish people to come to Messiah. And as he continues to show the rebellion of Israel, 
he's calling the believers in Rome to similar tenderness. Paul's care for Israel then fades into the proclamation that Israel has fallen, failed, not gotten to the telos, the goal of the instruction, the goal of all of our lives, eternity with Yeshua. He's the end, the goal of all of God's instructions. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And how did Israel do this? Remember the way to be right with God? If you remember that, you'll also know the way not to be right with God. In verse 3 we read, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Subjecting yourself to God and to his right standard simply means letting God be God in your life, disallowing yourself from ruling in your daily circumstances. You have to trust the Lord and believe him. This is subjecting yourself, making yourself the subject to the king, making yourself the servant, the very word by which Paul self-introduced in chapter 1. And just in case you missed it, in verse 4, it's the summary of all of chapter 9. And these few verses here, it says, Messiah is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. In other words, the end, the, the end game. The Torah's arrow is Messiah himself. Verse 5, if you want to live in the standard of Torah, you will be judged by that. And uh, don't be too confident in how you would do in that examination. Paul uses two texts from Torah to substantiate his claims. Leviticus 18.5 terminates this first section of this chapter. Deuteronomy 30 will be used later. Concerning this, uh, one of my favorite commentators named Dunn says this, quote, Paul seems to understand the passage in its most obvious sense that keeping the statutes and ordinances of the law was the way of living appropriate to the covenant, which the covenant required. Moses did not say, and Paul does not understand him to say, that keeping the law was a means of earning or gaining life in the future. End quote. Section B, or second section today, Moses and Joel, uh, Joel the prophet, testify of faith as the answer. All right, in verse 6, Paul begins a new section with a personification. It's an odd phrase. He says that righteousness speaks. And he quotes Moses in Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 to 14. And the citation stops short. Look at the text. It says, the, the word is in your mouth, and it's there. It's not up in heaven. It's not in the beyond the sea that we might do it. The to do it is missing in Paul. And some note that Paul is saying that in the past, no one was saved until Messiah came. And that's dead wrong. Again, this from Dunn, he says, quote, what Paul is objecting to throughout this letter is not the law or the commandment as such, but the law and the commandment understood in terms of works chapter 9, verse 32, in terms of national righteousness, chapter 10, verse 3. To put the same point another way, Deuteronomy 30 can be taken as referring to both eras of God's saving purpose. <clears throat> to the era of Israel before Messiah and to the era of all the nations brought in by Messiah. The contrast between Leviticus 18 and Deuteronomy 30, therefore, is not that the former is to be entirely referred to the old era, which the latter solely to the new. Rather, it's that the Leviticus passage emphasizes the discontinuity between the eras, whereas the Deuteronomy passage can bring out the continuity between the eras, the continuity precisely between the law and the obedience of faith. In this sense, too, it can be seen that the word of God has not failed, end quote. If you're on the Zoom call, I'm sure that will bring up all kinds of convo. We'll talk about that in a short while. Look, I define law, the term law, and remember, Paul uses this 70 times in the one book of Romans and in different occasions with different meanings. So I use the term law 
and we're not under the law in this understanding. I, I define law as the system by the which the practitioner attempts to gain God's favor. I think I'll say that again. I define law as that system by the which the practitioner attempts to gain God's favor. Grace, or in this context, righteousness by faith, may well be defined as the system of receiving God's favor without earning it. On the other hand, we earn. On the one hand, we earn. On the other hand, we don't earn, but we receive. Uh, some of you watching today are Americans, and for no apparent reason, each of you received $1,200 a few weeks ago. You didn't earn it. They simply put it into your account or you got a check. You didn't beg for it. You didn't send notes to the president. You didn't have to send a self-addressed postage paid envelope. It simply arrived. You received the benefits of it in spending or not. It's yours. You did nothing to earn it. And any earning you tried would have been without success. Paul said earlier in this book, the wages of sin is death. That was what we earned. So Deuteronomy 30 is Moses being called to the witness stand again. He says, the word is near us. The law has not failed. God has not failed, but we have. Now this is very hard to admit, but that admission is our entry pass. I like the word admit, like uh, the ticket stub, admit one as you enter the movie theater. If I pay my entry fee, I'm admitted into the benefits of that payment. I get to watch the movie. By agreeing with the condemnation of our people, which sounds horrible, but stay with me, we are admitted into the hospital of God's favor and grace. We're admitted into the theater. We're admitted to the museum. Some people use the term confess in this regard. I, I like both images, and I'll get to confession in a minute. Here's what I mean. Admission as I've said, allows me entree into the theater or the university course or the museum. I can go in, and I can't go in without that admission. And I can see, I can learn, I can experience all that the owner of the establishment wants me to have. So if we say we have failed today and stop trying to earn the favor of God and stop showcasing our good behavior, if we do all that and admit our failures, we are admitted into the waiting room of the kingdom of God. The other term I like to use here is the word, and it's here in the text, is the word confess. Verse 9 says, if we confess things, then something happens. Confession may sound very Catholic uh, to some of you, or very legal, uh, but let me tell you what I think it means. Confess, the dictionary definition would be, to agree together with something. Confess means to agree together with something. Let's say I commit a major crime. I, I kill a guy. The photos and the videos are on television nightly. And finally, I turn myself in to the police at the police station. My confession of the murder doesn't make the crime happen. It doesn't negate the crime. I simply agree together with the police, with the evidence, and with myself that I'm the guilty party. The Bible here says for us to be saved, that is to be in right relationship with God, we have to confess Jesus as Lord. My confession does not make this happen. Jesus has been Lord long before I thought about it. My confession of his lordship simply allows me the benefits of that reality. My confession is not the genesis of the reality. It gives me the entree into the reality. I agree together with God that Yeshua, Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, is Lord of all, and that includes me. And confession is not the only requirement. Otherwise, simple, you know, read this prayer, you know, here, read this. You don't know English, but read these words and you'll, you'll get to go to heaven. Uh, those commands would be enough to get everyone on the planet to be saved. A person also has to believe. Hmm. 
Now think about the verb to believe. Uh, some of you might remember Tinkerbell and Peter Pan. There the little fairy was losing her power and the characters of the story uh, break out and talk to the audience and they invite the audience, that's you and me, to just believe. And then Tink will reignite and substantially become strong again. You might remember the song that was sung by Cher, her hit song titled Believe, with some of the simplest and I say most redundant lyrics ever. Do you believe in life after love? Do you remember love? Do you believe in life after love? Do you remember love? Do you believe in life after love? Yeah, you get the idea. Is that all it is? Do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe? At every football match being played this weekend here in Australia, the crowd at home, and some will actually be in the stands this weekend too, is urged along by radio personalities and by the teams on the bench to believe that our team can bring home the victory. Just believe, they might shout. Well, those examples are not what's in view here in our text. Here we see particularized faith. That is, the reader is not only to believe, but to believe something in particular. Believe in your heart, the Bible says, that God raised Jesus from the dead. What does that include? Three things. One, the fact of history that there was a Jesus. Two, the fact of history that Jesus really died in context on a Roman cross at the crucifixion. And three, the fact of history that Jesus rose physically from the dead. Without those facts, your faith is merely Tinkerbell faith, and it's illusory, and it's a fable. But if you want the word of God to be near you in your heart and in your mouth, if you want the righteousness that's by faith, then it's particularized faith. Three facts. Do you believe those? The fact of history that there was a Yeshua. Two, the fact of history that Yeshua really died in context on a Roman cross at the crucifixion. And third, the fact of history that Yeshua rose from the dead. Moses has testified. Now Joel is called to the witness stand, and his verse is simply, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is, rescued, delivered, have a change of life, brought into the presence of God, or as we've said, made right with God. And our third section today, faith speaks, and so do Isaiah, and so should you. Paul ponders in this final section today how this message is going to get to the people, his series of rhetorical questions, you could read them rhetorically or not, helps us think this issue through. There are four questions he asks. One, how then will they call on him in whom they haven't believed? And two, how will they believe in him whom they've not heard? And three, how will they hear without somebody speaking, without a preacher? And four, how will they preach unless they are sent? He's, he's saying simply that some folks need to be sent so that people can hear. And if they hear, they might believe and thus call on Yeshua and be saved. Well, think about how you heard about I don't know, this Bible study group today. Think how you think how you learned the phrase, oh, what a feeling. Think how you finish the statement when you care enough to send the very best. If you ponder this for even only a moment, you'll get what the apostle is saying. He says that people need to have open ears and thus be able to hear what someone is saying. We need help on many levels but the power of advertising, the power of communicating to others is in our mouths. Psalm 81 says, open your mouths wide and I will fill it. If we open our mouths, God will fill them with good information. We're those who are being sent. We have to declare the good works of God to others. Otherwise, how will they ever know? I meet with people who say, 
that they don't believe much or there's a Jewish and Gentile couple and they say, we're going to let the children decide on their own but which religion they want to be. That's great. Have you given them options? Have you taught them what Jewish or Christian is? No, no, no. We're going to let them discover that on their own. Well, you're not helping the children in any way. Children need to be given options. And that includes all the information and not only children. I think everybody on the planet, look, I was raised an Orthodox Jew. I didn't have the option to believe in Jesus. Jesus, Shmesus, he was, he was, he was never one of ours. But once I started reading it in the books for myself, then I had options. Then I could make my own decision. In this way, Paul says that our feet can be beautiful. I've never really seen beautiful feet. I find them mostly functional and not stunning like eyes or a beautiful face. But Isaiah says that the one who brings good news, remember good news is the word gospel in Greek, has beautiful feet. He's quoting Isaiah. Paul is quoting Isaiah. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who says to Zion, your God reigns. It's in the going that the word gets out. Some people want to have a come and see, come to me philosophy. If they come to me, I'll tell them information. But it's in our going. That's what feet do. Feet don't sit. Feet are about going. It's in our going and telling that people can then hear and then believe and then be right with God. I believe the indictment of Israel is not only about our inability to hear or rejection or disbelief in not receiving Messiah. I believe Paul is indicting the people of Israel for not going to the nations and sharing this good news. I believe that the people not believing, that is the, the non, the Gentiles not believing was a function of the not going of Israel. Many people today, theologians, will say that Israel was never meant to be a missionary nation. I think that's exactly what caused our failure again and again. The evidence is there in verse 21. It's the terminus of the condemnation of Israel. We are without hope. So it sounds. Or are we? Look, if chapter 10 was the last word, then we're hopeless. But that's where chapter 11 comes in. Uh, before I run off from that, look at verse 17. There's a triangle I see, and I want you to see it as well. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's good news for each of us. If we don't have much faith today, hang in there. Faith can come. I like that assurance. And how does it come? It comes by hearing. For instance, are you listening to this talk today? Are you listening to what God might be saying to you just now about Yeshua, our Messiah? Opening our ears to the living one, to the one who was killed but rose from the dead. That's where real life comes. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes from the word of God. Here's the triangle. God spoke and now others speak in his name. We hear that and it goes into our heart and we follow up with faith. Then we speak and confess the faith we have. Remember, that doesn't make things happen. It's simply an agreement with what has happened already. And our own faith grows because faith comes by hearing even ourselves speak faith. So this triangle of faith works regularly. Speaking, hearing, believing. Speaking, hearing, believe, and you can start anywhere. I heard it, and so I believed it, and so I spoke it. Faith leads to confession, which leads to, which leads to more faith, which leads to more hearing and increased right living with God. Does that make sense to you? And when we hear it and we speak it, it not only builds our faith, but it builds faith in others. So we are being sent to our neighbors, to our co-workers. We're called to speak to our parents, to our children, to our cousins, the good name, the good works of God. Dear friends on Facebook and on this Zoom call, if you're not yet a believer in Yeshua, I urge you today, call on him while he's near. If you know your Torah and you know yourself, 
you know you need help. You need that admission ticket. You need to admit and confess, agreeing together with who God is and who Yeshua is, and speak that yourself. It's going to be worth all the social distancing people will give you when you tell them about God. If you want, you can pray a prayer with me just now to solidify your choice. Pray something like this. And it, the words don't matter so much as your heart bowing and your, your mouth speaking. So it, it's not what you say, it's that you say he's the boss. That That's really bottom line. Say something like this, Father, in Yeshua's name, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Yeshua to save me from myself, from my selfishness, from my despair, and the harm I caused so many. Thank you for making me right with God by your sacrifice. I receive Yeshua as my Savior and the lover of my soul. He frees me to love others. I repent of my sins, and I ask for God's forgiveness to be my portion. I confess Yeshua as my Lord. I receive the free gift of God. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, will you let us know via message on YouTube or write to me directly? I'll put my email address right here on the screen. I'd appreciate that. Next week, we'll look at the 11th chapter and watch how the apostle combines chapter 9 and chapter 10 and all he said before. Chapter 9 about sovereignty, chapter 10 about Israel's rejection, and showcases God's choice of the remnant as the perfect solution to the question of God's sure love to the community of faith. Make sure you join us live if you can, and then you get to have the conversation we'll have in just a few moments on Zoom. I'm delighted to be able to read and help us understand this book each Friday here from my home in Sydney, and I wish you all Shabbat Shalom.